Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning, you know. And uh, the topic, I think, is, is a very important one because uh, the world is becoming very crazy, unpredictable, and there are very few things we can predict. And basically, these things are, are in our own minds, and not in the newspapers, not in TV, se uh, TV shows, and uh, not even in the internet. So uh, we all very often talk about the religion, and we have, you know, religious ter terrorists, we have uh, jihadists, we have uh, Islamophobia, whatever we have, you know, we talk about with excitement, but we never go deeper to the substance of the issue. And uh, this is uh, early morning, and we need some morning drill. So uh, I'll try to ask you one question. Each of you, individually, do you think about religion as, as a part of your own? Just raise hands. So, few of, few of you. I will try to prove that it's not true. Uh, you see, uh, if we ask the question, does there, in, in a different way, does the religion play an important or substantial role in our lives, uh, then you will say yes. Much more of you will say yes. And uh, the question is only in which forms. The religion may be, you know, inherited from your parents. You live up with, with some moral system of religion. Nevertheless, what kind of religion? And you are very peaceful because these are moral norms of behavior in your family. They have been uh, rooted deeply in your family's history, and usually this form of religion is a very peaceful one. The other one is the people who are converted to some religion, not born with, with that religion in their family, but converted because of protest. And uh, they are protesters, and they are very dangerous because the majority of Convertites, or let's say the people can convert to some religion, which is not usually in the majority of the religion in their homeland, are rebellions. They try to attack, try to destroy, try to protest anyhow they uh, how they can, including the terrorism and including then the xenophobia. And the third one is the most popular one, and those who didn't raise their hands to this morning. Maybe is this a case of you? Every person sometime in their life comes to the question about creator. Who created us? What's my role in this world? What I'm doing in this world? You know, who I am? These questions come across for some people many times in their lives. For some people just once, but absolutely once, once in their lifetime because they're substantial questions of being. So if we answer the question rightly, if we put all these three parts together, we will say, yes, the religion still plays a substantial role in our lives. And even those who say, no, I disagree with you, and they, they, read, they write the books about the illusion of God, the only thing they want to, to, to prove is non-existence of the God. And this is a religion too, because it's again a, a question about who is the creator, even th if they oppose all these things. So on the personal level, we have to say yes. And uh, to me, myself, you know, just to explain my position, because it will not be fair if I just ask you a positions and don't uh, explain what, who, who I am. Uh, yes, uh, to me, you know, God is a collective subconsciousness. That means uh, if we use our brain and our mind, about few percent of the capacity of the brain, what's the other part? Subconsciousness. And this is collective for all of us. And all what we create ourselves during our lifetimes goes back to this subconsciousness as a collective intellect. Let's say collective intellect. 
God may be a collective intellect. Uh, but uh, this time uh, it's another topic because we are talking about, you know, artificial intellect. We are talking about, you know, gathering the information on iCloud. And this might be an alternative, a good one or not one, good one. That's still a question, and I'm not touch this question. But uh, usually, you know, I ask in my, my, my students' audiences, you know, do you talk to yourself? Do you really talk to yourself? Who talks to yourself in this audience? Just raise hands. It's morning drill. Yeah, yeah you see, still people talk to you. Who is that alter ego? Who is that alter ego? Perhaps, you know, some part from the con subconsciousness. Maybe the God. Some people call it God. Some people call it just, you know, alter ego. It doesn't matter. We need to talk to somebody. And a conversation with yourself is the most difficult conversation in your lives. It's much easier to talk with, with the other humans. It's very much easier to just communicate on internet because it has no responsibilities. That's the difference. But if we come to the structured communities, whether it has small communities, whether there are small cities or villages, or whether it are huge cities or even small states or huge states, we have to talk about uh, the role of religion on a, stru a structured community. And again, the question is, is it relevant today or not? It is. It is relevant uh, because uh, the religion is in the mind. You need holy books, okay, despite it's Bible or it's Quran, it doesn't matter. You have some written moral system, but basically it's in their mind. Do you know the joke? Are you ready for jokes? Yes. It's a Muslim Arab joke. I hope I haven't told you last year that one. Uh, a Muslim father buys a new iPhone to his son. And of course, he's a rich Muslim, can buy an iPhone to his son. And the first job what the young guy does, he downloads Quran. Uh, but Quran is a huge file. It takes some time, and he notes he needs to go to the bathroom. Do you know the joke? <laughs> he needs to go to the bathroom, you know. He's already, you know, a little bit nervous. By the end, you know, the Quran is loaded, and he's running to the bathroom. At the door of the bathroom, he just remembers it's forbidden to go with Quran into the bathroom. What to do? He picks up his phone and calls the Mufti. Mufti, my father bought me an iPhone. Your father is a generous man, my son. He, he's a really generous man. You know. The first what I did, I lo downloaded the Quran. Oh, you are a good Muslim because you, you did it right. No, Mufti, but I'm at, at the door of the bathroom, and I know that I cannot go in with the, with the Quran to the bathroom. Oh, Mufti hesitated for a while and then said, my son, do you know some parts of Quran by heart? Of course, Mufti, I do. You have been in the bathroom with Quran already. <laughs> Go in. You see, it's one of the best jokes because it's a little bit philosophical. It's about the people don't know what to do, they call Mufti. It's about the iPhone connecting world. It's also, you know, that uh, you see everything is in the mind. Everything is in the mind. So, but we look at the modern societies, we have a lot of uh, false stereotypes. Uh, about the societies. Some people declare that Europe is Christian plus Judaism, a territory of only two of these religions. And some people say, no, you have still Muslims there. You have to rethink this one, revisit your opinion, and change it to the, it's Europe is Christian, Judaism plus Islam. Yeah, in reality, it's right. But in our perception, not yet. But if we look at the Arab world, and everybody, if you ask on the streets about the Arab world, will say, this is a Muslim world. My God, this is a mistake. 
you have, you know, 10% Christians in Egypt, which is about over 20 million Christians in Egypt. This is not a Muslim world. If you go to Jordan, it's 5%. If you go to Lebanon, it's up to 40%, even more. You see, we have a false stereotype in the substance. Europe is Christian and Arab world is Muslim. It's not true. It's not true. The reality is much more different, and we have to change it. And, uh, and of course, you know, the community unites like, around these religions, you know, and uh, they go to church or you go to mosque, you know, and they take the service from, 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 the, from the servicemen. But uh, we have to understand that the religion is present. It is present in our societies, and it's present in all its forms. Because if we come to the state, there are two options. Religious state, more or less, that means you know, 99% of the, are the same religion. When the state declares that it's our religion, the like Islamic State of Iran, 99% Muslims. Uh, uh, or you have you know, a secular state which accepts all religions. And by the way, you know, it might be democracy, like most of the states in Europe. It might be dictatorship or semi-dictatorship. That's something kind of modern monarchy. And it might be monarchy, as Jordan is. But it's still a secular state. Saddam Hussein, Iraq, secular state. Dictatorship, but secular state. And this is the case that, you know, they never had religious conflicts. Because the state is separated, state uh, is protected, protecting all the religious groups. And, and you see in this conflict uh, in Iraq and in this uh, ISIS form, the, load, the world now knows that they are Yezids. Most of the world didn't know before that, that there are very differences. And we look at the, let's say, Christian ch church, you have a lot of denominations, a lot of denominations. So diversity of religion is a real large-scale diversity because one thing, we all are different. They're not two equal personalities, two equal human beings in this world. Then what to do? Uh, because if there is a, a one religion state, sooner or later it becomes xenophobic. And you see, it might be pan-xenophobic, we are the only ones, we are the, all the right ones, all the others are stupid. We have to rule the world because our religion is, is the most important, superior to the others. They might be sec sec uh, selective ones, you know? You see, if we talk about the uh, clash of civilizations, I don't like it because it's not a clash of civilizations. It's about something else because, you see, is Muslims are killing Muslims in Yemen just because of Shi-Sunni conflict. And Orthodox Russians are killing Orthodox Ukrainians. It's, it's not a clash of civilizations. It's something else. Still, the question is open what it is. But uh, if you want to go forward, what we had to do? We have to accept some very simple things. All religions are equal because they are created by the God. And all religions are different because they are created by the God. If you get it, you'll understand much more better. No superiority. Because, let's say, in my country, you know, we have several Christian denominations. And uh, let's say the Catholic and Orthodox and, and Protestant, sometimes they go to one church. If uh, some person wants to change from one to another, they just, yes, it's up to you, because it's your decision. Because you like to serve the God in a different way, please, okay. And, and this is maybe the beginning, and that's why I'm very proud of my country, that uh, you have the differences, and they are not confronting each other. And nobody is superior to the other ones. And can you imagine, you know, the, 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 the Pope visited, the Francisco visited uh, 
my country in September, he was praying together with the Orthodox Archbishop, with the Protestant Archbishop, and he was very happy. He was very happy because it's something which had to be implemented in the rest of the world. But um, we also have to understand that uh, the religion will play the role. Will play. Despite we say sometimes there is no God, we try to prove it, religion will play because people need some moral systems. And these moral systems may differ, but in the substance they are about the same. So uh, I would say that uh, we have to really increase the knowledge about each other. I told you about the, the, uh, the statistics. Maybe it's not important for the statistics. When uh, sometimes uh, the journalists, the journalists ask me about my approach to this problem, I just ask the counter question. What's in your language, Allah? And they don't know. And they, God bless, O Lord Almighty, is the same what the Muslims say in Arabic. Only in Arabic. So and this is the ignorance of such a scale that it's not helping us. It's not just helping us. The other point of ignorance is that if you know, see 500 years in the Christian world, Martin Luther wrote, every person must be able to read the Bible in his own language. It happened 500 years ago. And now if you look at the, the, the Protestant world, it started from Martin Luther. It's the most tolerant world. You mentioned yesterday about the, the women in the power, in many cases, because everybody has this, what in English is called the cri uh, critical thinking, you can read, evaluate, decide, and not to call mufti. And the problem with the Muslim world, and I always when I'm in the Muslim world, so tell them, you say, if you have illiteracy rates, 10, 20, 40, in Afghanistan even 70 percent, and nobody can read the Quran. And if you have Turks, 80 mil million people, you know, in mosques listening the Mufti in Arabic, they have to be some change. That change happened 500 years ago, and it changed a lot. Of course, there were wars. It was a tragedy in history, but basically what we see today is an end point of what Martin Luther did 500 years ago. So we need some kind of enlightenment. I will finish here about the religion, and now about the nationalism. You see, we are crazy because we are talking about the nationalism as something very special, new, uh, and uh, aggressive, and negative. I was in a conference in Cairo a few months ago. This was a conference, Islam and the West. And the Muslim people, you know, very educated people, were talking about the nationalism, rise of nationalism in Europe is something very, very bad one. And ask him the simple question, and I ask this question, the same question to you. Are you nationalists? Raise your hands. Somebody is calling me who is a nationalist. <laughs> and I'll tell you one more joke. Uh, so, who feels himself a nationalist? And I'll say, yes, me. Yeah, some people. Only few. But now, raise your hands. Who have forgotten his or her ethnic roots? Oh, one cosmopolitan, two cosmopolitans. What's in between? You see? If I ask the question, who is nationalist? Two raised. If I ask who have lost his ethnic roots? Two. We are much more than four people in this room. What's in between? So, and I asked these guys sitting in, 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 in the audience, uh, a lot of Muftis, and say, do you, do you really think that you are not Arabs? Do you really think that you are not Egyptians? And there were some French people, and I said, you, don't you really think you are French or Belgian? And everybody, yeah, we didn't think about that. 
You see, uh, we, everybody, I, I really, I, I'm not sure that these two who rise their hands, they have lost the roots. Uh, I don't think that's true. They maybe want to lose the roots, but uh, it's impossible. Because again, the ethnic cultural roots are inherited from the parents, from the history of definite family. And you all have families. You have father and mother. Everybody has a father and mother. And you can't change it because it's, again, it's in the mind. The problem is that my, there are several kinds of nationalism. And uh, that, with, with all the world is talking about, is a xenophobic nationalism. It's also nothing new. Because uh, there were, make the Germany first, make the Italy first, and now we have the, make the America first, make the Russia first. Nothing to say, we Chinese are the first already. You see, uh, if you have a xenophobic nationalism, then that's a problem. Because you put above yourself, above the others. And you, you can imagine, the national states have a history only 100 years. The first national states were born 100 years ago, after the First World War. Before they were empires. And the empires didn't have majorities and minorities. Because they were expanding because of war contribution, gaining new resources, and inhabitants who pay taxes. Nothing has changed in that days. Today's also the state needs, you know, inhabitants could pay taxes, you know, and use their natural resources or human resources. Nothing has changed. But uh, nation states, which were born 100 years ago, couldn't draw the right borders. Very few ones could. And you have majority, ethnic majority, and ethnic minority, only for 100 years. And the closest uh, example to this point of Berlin is this South Tyrol, Zoo Tyrol. Uh, still, Italy, Germany, or Austria, more precisely. So uh, this is a problem of national state. How to deal with that? If we uh, take the same principle that you can't change it because it's in the mind, and it's only private space in today. If you go outside your room, if you open your mouse, you, you, it's not more private. Nothing to say, but if you click on internet, it's nothing private anymore. The only private space in modern world is your mind. What is collected, hidden, or whatsoever, what's created in your mind. And therefore, you can't change it. Then you have to destroy the physical body. And that's not good. But it's happening still. So because before you accuse somebody of being nationalism, don't forget about your own nationalism, about your own national identity. And then think about who is superior, this one or you. And if you understand, and again, there is no superiority. They are not superior nations, small or big ones, powerful or not powerful ones. All the nations are created by God, therefore they are equal. And we can turn this in inclusive nationalism. What does it mean? It means the majority in a different nation state takes care of the minorities. It's full responsibilities. Protect the minorities, give the minorities the right to speak, to, to practice their culture, you know and enjoy that. That means education, not, and also the protection by the state. And if you go uh, wider out the national state, it's a sharing nationalism. And, and, and uh, the principle of sharing, you know, I first heard about it 10 years ago, 99, the two, 2010, 2010 financial economic crisis, Davos, the last brainstorm, the first meeting of G20. What is the advice? There were two advices by smart people in that room, and there were a lot of smart people in that room. 
please don't allow protectionism. It was 2010, eight years ago, already nine. And the second was, if you want to improve the world, we have to share knowledge, technologies, even, you know, everything what you have. And what you see, the, the, the difference in real life with the Internet with no borders, the globalized economy, the uh, international supply chains for companies, it already exists. The only place it doesn't exist is in our mind. And uh, in collective mind of definite country and politics of definite country. So uh, if we turn the nationalism into inc inclusive nationalism and sharing nationalism, there will not be place for xenophobic nationalism. Usually we ask, what's the recipe? What to do? Share, protect, be responsible. And if, is this possible? Yes, it is possible. OK, now a few words about the populism. Yesterday there were a lot of things said about the populism. And I, I totally agree what was said yesterday. And I agree with the, uh, with, with the perception, you know, because the perception is very important, or not even the fact, uh, because uh, you need the vox populi, the voice of the people, and you need the politicians who can herd the vox populi and understand the, 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 the voice of the people. But they also need to talk to the people, and in the same language, vox populi. That's a problem that we have Vox Populi, the voice of the language from the people, and you have the language of bureaucrats and politicians from, from the other side. And then you know the both sides don't understand too much each other. That's, that's true. That's true. Uh, and of course, what are the reasons for populism? It's the easiest way to get power. It's the easiest way to win elections. Because what you do first, you scare the people, like migration. And you say, we are going to protect you. So you create a problem and immediately say, I'm going to solve your problem, even if you don't know how to solve it. Even if you don't know how to solve it. And uh, if you add to this irresponsible promises, then you get but that populism, which is a very bad one. But we look from the other side, the pragmatic parties, let's say in political systems, the pragmatic parties, need at least one dose of populism. That means they need to, uh, to understand the people's language and to explain to the people in their language what they are doing in the benefit of the whole people. It is not happening. Uh, and it happened in my country. We had a problem of, of what's called the heritage of, of Soviet Union or occupation of 50 years, which called non-citizens, the people who don't have citizenship. They don't apply for Latvian citizenship. They don't apply for Russian citizenship. They don't apply for German citizenship. They just say as they are. They are citizens of the Soviet Union in their mind with the Latvian passports. And there was a question about, you know, to stop it, you know, because uh, the kids who are born must have the Latin citizenship. The popular attitude, it's a attitude from the nation was 70% we have to stop it. The 100 members of parliament voted against. What do you have? Re really, we have an example. Wax properly? They don't care? And then it's a problem. So because uh, peep in this world, when the inequality, inequality is rising year from year, already for the last 30 years, globally and locally, people will accept inequality. Because usually somebody is richer than you and somebody is poorer than you. But they will not accept unfairness. And that's what's happening. If the people have a perception that something is going in their state, not in a fair way, they were going to protest, like in France. We have this is in France. Because uh, fair is a perception 
Unequality is a fact. Perception is much more important in nowadays. In a modern world, the politicians must be, must be the management of perception. It's like peace and, and war. What is security? Security is perception. War is already a fact. And I'll end up with the joke with the phone. Usual, usually I, I switch off the phone. I was on a funeral, and there were about 12 people only on the funeral. Because it was a lone, lonely person, you know, no relatives, you know, no friends, very old one. And the priest was giving the last words, the person who is passing away. And now the phone rang. All 12 people were looking around. Who is that? And the priest, who was over 80 years old, picked up the phone, as, and he said before that, and let's ask the God, and the phone rang. And he picked up the phone, and he said, I can't talk right now. I'm at the funeral. So, uh, and it, those two, 12 people, despite it was a very sad moment, started to laugh. Because, let's ask the God. And the smartphone rang. He said, I can't talk. I'm in a funeral. I hope we are not in the funeral of humanity. And I hope that uh, everybody has an optimistic view what we have to do, how we have to address each other, and what's the role of nationalism, which will be present all the time, and what's the role of religion, which will be present all the time, and what is the role of populism, which will be present all the time. The only answer is we have to adapt to understand what's good and what's bad. Thank you very much for your attention. And so this is historical, this is proven, you know, there's data for it. And so in America, there's always been this thing about white nationalism, black nationalism, and so forth. Now we have the immigration issue, both in Europe and the United States, the reaction to nationalism. America used to be defined like the American dream, an immigrant country. And now with Mr. Trump, everything is topsy-turvy. People are finding out, well, is it really the American dream? Is it the melting pot? Is it really the thing? So I think in each, when we look at nationalism, we have to look at it in different contexts. Like the developing countries. I think nationalism, democracy, and anti-racism are three sides of the same coin, and they should go together for the developing countries. Mm -hmm. Because the developing countries with various ethnic groups have got to create a nationalist consciousness in order that they could build a nation state. Now, Europe went through that already, and the ethnicity of Europe and so forth. So different contexts. So nationalism is not really bad. You have to look at it in the various contexts. And I think here in Europe, the word populism, I think we have to revisit it. Because if you think of populism, the opposite to populism is elitism. Mm -hmm. I'm not an elitist. I'm a populist. I believe the grassroots should have a chance. I believe that we should write the history of those whose history have not been written, who are at the margin of history, but make history, but the history have not been written. So in this sense, I think you have to find another word for populism. And I think white people, both in America and, the United, uh, and Europe, you all are not dealing with the concept of white nationalism, and you're confusing it with populism. And I think that's the problem, yep. fundamental problem. Yep. Because you can't take a concept of populism and then distort it. We know what fascism is. We know what Nazism is. We know what democracy is. But it seems to me, during the week I'm here, I've heard several speakers, the way they define populism in relation to the reaction of a small group of people to immigrants cannot be the definition of populism. I fully agree. I fully agree, because it was very good comment. Because uh, I didn't mention the, that democracy is one of the tools 
we can use you know, to eliminate the xenophobic uh, nationalism and to create an inclusive and sharing uh, nationalism. Because, because uh, that's the principles of democracy, which is going to be work. And if you talk about the rise of, of, of populism or nationalism in Europe, you know, few percent doesn't matter. Few percent. We are, you know, exciting or let's say or concerned, you know, about two, three, five, ten, maximum fifteen. And uh, how to get uh, rid of this, uh, not nationalism, but populism, mm -hmm. give these um, populist responsibilities. And uh, we have an example of true Finns in Finland. Uh, Reducing, because if, if the populist needs to be responsible about something, he bec be be becomes not anymore a populist, he becomes an average citizen. This is very important to understand. And we have to, you know, not to be arrogant to these populists, or not to be arrogant to definite small groups of nationalists, because if we are arrogant, we make them stronger. We sh have to do something in a different way. With the nationalists in the democra democratic way, is the principles of democracy, freedom, all freedoms. We have in my country 27% of Russian minority. We have an absolutely free media that means they can watch the Russia's propaganda 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And nevertheless, they are integrated in the, in the national society. Yeah? Because freedom of speech, freedom of of religion, freedom of your ethnic, you know, culture, uh, protection of your businesses. So they say, yeah. And you know, there are some red lines, like war propaganda or hate speech. Immediately, you are in a prison. <laughs> really, you are in a prison. You know, a guy who uh, went to to fight for ISIS, six years in the prison. So you have to be very strict on the red lines. Hate speech, word propaganda. Uh, thank you very much for your good uh, speech. Uh, I would like to ask a question about uh, religion, because uh, you spoke about religion as uh, an individual uh, thing. Uh, thing and, uh, for example, in my country, uh, the most important religion is Islam. And there is a big difference be uh, between uh, Muslim and between Islamists. Yep. Because uh, the Muslim, they say, uh, to make a joke, they say, uh, Musli difference between uh, Muslim and Islamist, uh, Muslim uh, think that uh, God is protecting him. And the, uh, the Islamist think that he, have, he has to protect uh, God. And the uh, other thing, they say, uh, Muslim uh, uh, aims to go to uh, heaven. Mm -hmm. But Muslim uh, wants to send everyone to mm -hmm. hell. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the, the Muslim is uh, yep. peaceful, but the Islamist is always searching uh, um, to, uh, looking for uh, dominate other people to say you have to eat that, you have to wear that, you have to do that and, uh, and so on. And I think that uh, 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 Islamism or what we call political Islam is really uh, some poison. 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 poison for our, our societies because it doesn't uh, let us uh, live uh, with freedom. With uh, you, you are Muslim, so you must do that and that and that. And it is very, very difficult to be to to be compatible with uh, freedom, democracy, and other values of uh, modernity. Before you answer, you yes, I, I totally, I totally agree. Absolutely right. But uh, oh, you see, things are developing. And when I, I was in the room, it was full of muftis, you know, I said, you know, please listen to me. You talk about the crusaders and Romans, you know, I'm Roman. If I, sometimes I go, I'm American because I'm white. But, uh, you know, it's not true. And then I told them the story that my country was invaded by the crusaders in the beginning of the 13th century with the sword and the cross. Uh, and it was not a, a nice procedure which brought the Christian, Christianity to my, my native land, uh, but uh, it brought uh, new technologies and it brought a c very close ties with the rest of the Europe. At the same time, I'll tell you a story from my life. 
because everything is in the mind. It's what I want you to really understand. I was visiting the Pope uh, Benedict, and I was bringing as a present a facsimile edition of uh, uh, history of Christianity in, in, in Livonia, that means Latvia and Estonia, uh, and it was firstly issued 1888. And the Pope was very so happy, and he was, you know, oh, you Latvians are so nice people, you know, you really have, you know, documented all the, the, the beginnings of Christianity in your land. And to my mind, from un unconsciousness, was absolutely different uh, vision. I said, oh, those crusaders. <laughs> and I was surprised about myself, you know, because, you know, you see, uh, we have to understand that things in the past, uh, history were not all good things done by the religious people, you know, but we are people of today. Okay, I, 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 I try one, to do one, one, one second. Uh, the role of Latvia, the role of the... Uh, yeah, but you know, I'm old guy. I can't remember all the questions. Okay. You know. uh, uh, so about the Latvia, you see, uh, there's an advantage of the small nation. We are only two million. It's a small city, worldwide. We are much more flexible. We need each other much better than the big nations, even, even inhabitants of one big city. So it's much easier to talk to each other. Not so easy, but it's much easier. So we have to tell each other that the next role, I will tell you, you know, for 20 minutes, we have to be educated. We have to be much more educated than the rest of the world. We should not look only in the tablets. We should keep on creative, creative, to improve creativity and arts, by the way. That's the culture. And uh, th that, that question, I would answer not yet. Uh, because uh, if you remember the last part of me myself, why I feel so comfortable with all the religions? Because, you know, I get the substance. I've got the substance, you know. And that means, you know, not just flying around in your lives, you know, but who I am here, what I'm doing in this, and what I'm going to do in this. And uh, if you want to get the answers, you know, um, it's not about religion. Who knows the TED Talks? Yeah. Just click my last name, TED Talks, uh, uh, or TEDx, uh, and you'll get a 20-minute speech about how this can be a positive factor in your life. That means, you know, maybe you have not come to that point. Maybe you don't understand. It's not about the Jesus Christ or Muhammad. It's about God. One, one question, small question, which requires a long answer, but if you can answer in three, mm, sure. three, three uh, sentences. But it's about the recommendation from Davos, mm -hmm. the smart guys in Davos. Uh, the Soviet Union was a dictatorship, centralized state of dictatorship. Uh, professedly to realize socialism, communism. Isn't there a danger that we are moving into a 
centralized world on the basis of capitalism. Because uh, under guts, for instance, if we take the harbors and decide to uh, liberalize them, <coughs> and we in the northwest of Iceland want to protect a little harbor there, it's protectionism, <coughs> it's subsidies. Isn't uh, aren't we moving into a world where capital is here and capital interests and democracy is on the other side? Mm -hmm. You see, uh, I would answer in a different way. There was a very good article, uh, uh, I think it's uh, in the Financial Times, a couple of weeks ago. The capitalist needs to recreate the comp competitiveness. The monopoly is, is a disaster. And how to get back the competitiveness? And, and that's what you're talking about, the regulation. Can the world be, be centralized? Never. You see, and answer one, one more to you, the young person, you know, about the moral and about the centralization. The communists said that working people of all the world unite. We are going to rule the world. It didn't happen. The Maoists said the same, you know, we are going to rule the world. The world will be Maoist, Maoist world. It didn't happen. The jihadists say that we are going to create a jihad world. It's not going to happen. So, because the world is much more complex. You can't guide the world from one headquarters. It's impossible. About the moral, moral frame, you see, I have lived in a communist state the half of my life. And it was atheist state, that means no God, no sexual minorities, no sex at all. It was a very strange system, you know. But we have the moral laws of Builders of communism. Yes, that's what I said. It's a region of different kind. Uh, that's a problem. That's a problem uh, because it's a strong, strong uh, self discipline. I just will be very frank with you. How many, how do you think, how often I go to church? Yeah. Uh, twice a year. The first is, is a military, because it's short, with a military orchestra in the church, and I like the speech, because all are very pragmatic. The second is an Independence Day. And sometimes on the third is, is Christmas, but that's all. No, no, no. Funerals is something different. I hate funerals. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you.